Section 27 of The Empresses of Constantinople. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Lee. The Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph McCabe. Chapter 18, Part 1. Anna of Savoy. The first wife of Andronicus III, Irene of Brunswick, had died prematurely five years after her marriage. Andronicus had quickly recovered from his grief and plunged again into his customary pleasures, but his grandfather insisted that the throne of the Empress must not remain vacant. Whatever substitute for an all mock de Goth of the times afforded was scanned once more, and it was discovered that the young Count of Savoy had an eligible sister named Jeanne. The little principality which was destined to have so important an influence on the fortunes of Europe had only been recently carved out of the German Empire, and the name of the ruling house was in high esteem. It was still, however, a mere patch of the hills and valleys of Switzerland, and when legates came from the Byzantine court for the hand of Jean, she was readily yielded to them. Whether Anna, as the Greeks promptly christened her, would find Constantinople equal to the reputation of its splendor that still lingered in Europe may be doubted. The majority of the gorgeous palaces in which our earlier empresses had moved were now heaps of ruins. From the roofs of the public and imperial buildings, the copper had been torn to make coin, and the marble from their facades and halls had gone to deck the palaces of Venice and Genoa. Great stretches of desolate, ruin-encumbered spaces existed within the crumbling walls, and the streets no longer glittered with the proud display of tr domestic treasure on the balconies as a royal calvacade passed along. Some gold and silver may still have lingered in the reduced palaces before the disastrous civil war, but the display now made in the imperial households and processions was largely a display of imitation diamonds and gilded furniture. For the first time, in fact, we find Constantinople itself impressed by its visitors, even from the small court in Savoy. The Count had sent with his sister a large escort of knights, and as the marriage was deferred for eight months, they had ample time to exhibit their skill in tournaments. Why the marriage was postponed from February 1326 to October must be left more or less to the imagination. Cantacuzinus observes that Anna was indisposed after her journey, but one may find more enlightenment in his casual remark that Andronicus was ill, and after receiving his betrothed, went for some months into Thrace. It would probably be indelicate and impertinent to attempt a diagnosis. He returned in the autumn, married and crowned Anna, and permitted her train of knights to return to Savoy. Since Byzantine history is too full of large and tragic matters to recount the small details of domestic life, and since the empresses would, in their early years, if they were fortunate, be confined to these small domestic interests, we pass lightly over the youth of Anna of Savoy. In the spring, after their marriage, she accompanied Andronicus to Didymotachus, and would be faintly interested in the conferences of Andronicus and his mother with the king of Bulgaria. In the following year, Andronicus dethroned his grandfather, and Anna found herself mistress of the empire. The scene at Didymotachus, during the illness of her husband two years afterwards, would complete her introduction to Byzantine politics, and make her realize the importance of Cantacuzinus and his friends. Andronicus was, however, still a comparatively young man, and it was probable that he would outlive the older intriguers about him. He was only 34 years old at the time of his dangerous illness, and he returned to his boisterous sports and gaieties. In 1332, Anna, who was at Didymotachus, gave birth to a son, and Andronicus came on the scene in a mood of wild rejoicing. His Olympic Games and Western Jousts alarmed and scandalized elderly ministers who shuddered to see the sacred breast of an emperor expanded boldly to meet a lance. But he laughed at etiquette, told his courtiers to put away the kind of silk-covered mitres that they have had hitherto been compelled to wear at court, and allowed them to have any dress or headgear they pleased. Fun and good fellowship were his ideals. He kept, to the despair of the imperial treasurer, 
a vast number of hounds, horses, and hawks, and there was no better way to secure a favor than to present him with a good dog or horse. It is just to add that Andronicus made a sincere attempt to improve the administration of justice in the empire, but apart from this one sincere and fruitless effort at reconstruction, he danced down the road of death like all his frivolous subjects. A little war, the suppression of a rebellion or two, and mighting hunting and jousting filled the thirteen years of his single reign. The Turk drew nearer and nearer and received no very serious check. The city of Nicaea had now fallen into the hands of the Turk, and the crescent flashed on the shores of the Sea of Marmara. Andronicus could do little more than trust the old Byzantine weapon. Intrigue, ruse, diplomacy. His sister Anna, who had married the prince of Epirus, assassinated her husband and invited her brother to annex the territory. His daughter Irene, who had married the emperor of Trebizond and found him unfaithful, assassinated her husband and sent to Andronicus for a ruler. He was endeavoring to profit by these assassinations when death overtook him. Earlier in his reign, the veteran Sergini had rebelled. Andronicus, knowing the mettle of his opponent, had fortified and victiculed the palace, where he left Anna and her boy and gone out to the field. But he removed the danger in the end by deception and assassination. At length, in the early summer of 1341, Andronicus became alarmingly ill. He shrewdly put off his stained purple and retired to a monastery in preparation for death. And he passed away on the 15th June, leaving Anna with two boys of nine and four years. Then began the romance of Anna of Savoy. The chief person of the romance, apart from the empress, are the ambitious intriguers we have previously seen about the sickbed of Andronicus. The courtly and cultivated Cantacuzinus, the meaner, though less hypocritical financier, Apocacus, and the mother of Cantacuzinus. Theodora Palogina was, as her name implies, herself a member of the Palogii family. She was a descendant of Martha, the sister and counselor of Michael Palogius, the viral lady who had been put in a sack with cats by Theodore Lacarsus, a strong and abled and ambitious woman, although, since her husband's death, she had worn the robe of a nun. There was a complete understanding between her and her less resolute son. Apocacus, on the other hand, an active, restless, and scrupulous little man, who slept little at nights, was prepared to ally himself with either Anna or the Cantacuzini, as seemed most profitable. We have no reason to doubt the statement of Cantacuzinus that when Andronicus lay dying, Apocacus urged him, directly and through his mother, to seize the crown, and that he refused. He was not in the habit of acting so promptly. He went to the palace in which Anna wept with her boys, assured her that he would protect them, and placed five hundred guards about the palace. It may have occurred to Anna that there was no one except himself from whom they needed to be protected. Andronicus died on the following day, and she went, as Cantacuzinus would have foreseen, to spend the customary nine days in mourning by the remains of her husband. What Cantacuzinus might have done while she kept her dreary vigil in the monastery, we cannot say, for his plans were interrupted. On the fourth day, Anna surprised him by breaking the sacred custom and returning to the palace. It argues some strength of character in her that she should take this step, though it was not an original inspiration. Apocacus had changed sides, and had gone to warn Anna that his rival aimed at the throne and she must return to watch him. But Cantacuzinus was even more surprised and baffled when the patriarch now came forward with the will of the late emperor and read from it that he, the patriarch, was to be the guardian of the young princes and their empire. The maze of intrigue that followed can be very well imagined and is fairly described in the chronicles. In fact, Gregorus and Cantacuzinus profess to give verbatim reports of the very lengthy speeches which, it seems, took the place of conversation in those days. The three aspirants to power besieged the chamber of Anna in turns and each spent many hours in assuring her of his loyalty and of the disloyalty of all the others. Though the strain made the empress ill, she seemed to have acted almost throughout with good judgment. The patriarch was her safest supporter, since each of the other two 
really aimed at the throne, and to the patriarch she clung, only tempering his advice by a fear of angering the two nobles and driving them to a coalition which would be fatal to her. The patriarch urged her to crown her elder boy John at once. It would be an effective step. But when Cantacuzinus and Apocacus protested that it could not be done at a time of mourning, she thought it best to refrain. At last, some kind of settlement was reached. Cantacuzinus was to be the Magnus Domesticus, or Major Domo, on an imperial scale, and to lead out the troops to check the advancing Bulgarians and Turks in Thrace. Apocacus was dissatisfied, and as soon as his rival had departed, he made a bold attempt to seize power. He had on the fringe of the city, by the seashore, a strongly fortified house, or castle, in which he could withstand an attack, even of troops. It was impregnable, except to a large force on the land side, and a galley waited always at its private wharf on the other side to convey him by sea in case of need. His plan was to carry off John to this castle, and then dictate his terms to the empress. Anna, however, was warned in time. The young prince was actually in the hands of his schemer when her young servants were sent to the rescue, and Apocacus fled to his fortress and barred the doors. Cantacuzinus returned in haste to the city and set a troop of soldiers to watch the castle, but the empress, on the advice of the patriarch, refused to take extreme measures. As long as the two deadly rivals were poised against each other, her position was more secure. We must not, of course, attribute this prudent policy entirely, or mainly to the inexperienced young empress. The patriarch was its chief author, and through the patriarch was by no means disinterested. He could not aspire to the throne. There can be no doubt that, ill and weary as she was, Anna acted with good judgment. Thwarted and exasperated, Cantacuzinus, in his turn, now mediated a coup, and it was only the singular irresolution or hypocrisy of his nature and the boldness of the patriarch that prevented it from being successful. One day, while he was discussing the situation with Anna, they heard a tumultuous rush and angry voices in the hall without. Anna asked the cause, and Cantacuzinus, professing that he did not know and going to learn, lightly reported that a crowd of soldiers and young nobles had penetrated the palace and were hectoring the patriarch. They insisted, he said, that Cantacuzinus should be allowed to enter the palace on horseback, an imperial prerogative, when he called, and the patriarch opposed them. He had, he told the empress, scolded the patriarch for even listening to the young fools, and had driven them from the palace, and he advised the empress to admonish or punish them. It seems quite clear that in this case, a rather weak but deliberate plot on the part of Cantacuzinus had been foiled by the patriarch. The Magnus Domesticus then returned to the field, leaving his mother to watch the empress, and threatening that he would punish any man who gave her anxiety in his absence. Gregorius says that he took with him an enormous sum of money, and we may conclude that he went with a fairly clear intention to raise the provinces. As soon as he removed his troops to Thrace, his rivals set to work in deadly earnest. Apocacus was pardoned at the instance of the Patriarch, and promoted to the dignity of Grand Duke and Prefect of Constantinople. So far, the policy was sound enough, but it was, no doubt, impossible for the ailing young Empress to maintain the equilibrium any longer in face of their passion and perfidy of their opponent, and they plunged into civil war. Cantacuzinus was declared to be deposed, and it was even understood in the city that the patriarch promised the open gate of heaven to any man who would assassinate him. His friends and relatives were alarmed and fled to the deserted meadows beyond the walls where they had passed the night, and as they learned in the morning that their property had been confiscated, they hurried to the camp at Didymotechus with loud cries of Cantacuzinus, Emperor! After a becoming parade of real or feigned reluctance, the commander of the troops consented to accept the purple and prepared for civil war. An imperial outfit was hastily made at Didymotechus, so hastily that as the vain Cantacuzinus complains, the tunic was far too short, while the mantle hung about him like a sack, and the coronation took place. The ceremony gives us another empress of an not uninteresting character. Cantacuzinus was married to Irene, daughter of a court official of the former royal family of Bulgaria. 
Her mother had been Irene Paleogena, daughter of Michael Paleogius and Theodora. She remained tearful and anxious at Didymotechus, while her husband led out his troops, but she would afterwards take a vigorous part in the struggle. Irene's mother-in-law was the first victim of her own and her son's ambition and of the hatred of his enemies. Cantacuzinus, who always speaks with respect, if not generosity, of Anna, tells us the empress was not responsible for the barbarous treatment and death of his mother. She was imprisoned in one of the palace cells as soon as the trouble began, and from her dreary room she could hear the rabble of Constantinople shouting their customary obscene abuse of her and her son, and acclaiming Anna and John V. The young prince had been crowned at once by the patriarch. It was the early winter, and the aged Theodora was treated with studied insult and severity by her jailers. Her health soon broke, and she died in the palace dungeon. Cantacuzinus relates that a royal nun who had assisted and consoled his mother went to reprove Anna for the brutality to which she had been exposed. But he adds that Anna was ignorant of it and blameless. The close of the career of Theodora Palogina is one of the many reminders that to the end of the Byzantine Empire did not lack strong men and women. What it lacked was sound moral and patriotic feeling. The stock was not outworn and enfeebled, as historical writers are apt to say of decaying civilizations. Its strength was tainted and misdirected. The royal nun, I may add, who had visited Theodora in her cell was Theodora, daughter of Andronicus, the elder, and widow of Michael of Bulgaria, who here is seen for the last time. The course of the long civil war need not to be followed here. It opened disastrously for Cantacuzinus. Anna, Cantacuzinus tells us, longed for peace and proposed that he should not hold the chief power in the empire, though not wear the purple, and that his daughter, Helena, should marry her son, the Emperor John. It would have been the best settlement, but it did not suit the ambition of Apocacus and the Patriarch. Apocacus urged the Patriarch to live in the palace and bribed Anna's servants to watch her day and night in order to prevent her from communicating with Cantacuzinus. Later, Cantacuzinus visited the famous monks of Mount Athos and induced them to send a few of their community to plead with Anna to arrest the shedding of Christian blood. But the monks were intercepted by the patriarch and converted to his view of the situation before they reached the empress. End of section 27. Recorded by Michelle Lee. Section 28 of the Empresses of Constantinople. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph Maccabee. Chapter 18. Part 2. Anna of Savoy After three years of indecisive warfare, Apocalchus was assassinated. He had, at the beginning of the war, filled the palace dungeons with prisoners, and he augmented their number continually with nobles or officials who ventured to dissent from his plans. In the summer of 1345, he was building a new and formidable prison in the palace grounds, and the prisoners looked with concern on the frowning edifice, and readily believed that he was going to inflict all kinds of atrocities on them. One afternoon he went, without his usual company of guards, to see how the work progressed, and imprudently entered the yard where the prisoners were. One of them snatched a heavy piece of wood and felled him, and the others, seizing the axes and tools that lay about, ended his life and exhibited his head to the guards on the other side of the wall. Anna was alarmed and perplexed, and allowed the wife of the dead minister to take a fearful vengeance. The rowers of the fleet were armed and discharged upon the prisoners, and it is said about two hundred of them were butchered. Cantacuzinus now sent fresh proposals of peace, which were approved by the patriarch, and Anna made the grave and somewhat obscure blunder of rejecting them. Gregorius says that she was jealous of Irene, 
But Gregorius, for theological reasons which will appear presently, is not generous to the empress. It is possible that Cantacuzenus insisted on retaining his crown. However that may be, the war continued for another year, and began to turn in favor of Cantacuzenus, who now detached a large body of Turks from the service of the empress. Anna's conduct, in fact, now becomes weak and blundering. She quarreled with the patriarch, and allowed herself to be influenced by the meaner monks and bishops who opposed him. Abacalchus had so completely relieved her of the work of administration that she paid little attention to it after his death. And as a new heresy now entered Constantinople and won a favor, she became absorbed in the theological quarrel, while her enemy crept closer to Constantinople. On the 2nd of February, 1347, Anna convoked a large gathering of bishops and monks at the Blackany Palace. They met a judge and deposed the patriarch John, who opposed the new heresy. Its tenets do not concern us, but, as it will complicate the story of the empresses throughout the chapter, we may say that Palamism, as it was called, had discovered a plurality of divinities, in the sense of divine energies, in God, and its opponents retorted that this was a return to polytheism. The discovery is said to have been made originally by some of the contemplative monks on Mount Athos, whose quaint device for raising themselves to a state of trance cannot with delicacy be described here. On this second day of February, therefore, Anna listened with delight in her Blarkany Palace to the heated discussion of the light which was seen on Mount Thabor and other phases of the controversy. None of the gifted seers were able to tell her that Contacazinus and his troops were only a few miles away, and that he had already bribed some of her soldiers to open the golden gate to him that very night. The patriarch was deposed, and Anna and her bishop sat down to a festive banquet, and the making of not very modest jokes, says Gregorus, about their late archbishop. They were alarmed for a moment by a messenger, who rushed in to say that Cantacuzenus and his army were approaching. But Anna concluded that this was a ruse of the patriarch, and the banquet continued merrily. She was awakened in the grey dawn the next morning to hear that Cantacuzenus was master of the city. He had marched with a thousand picked men by an unaccustomed rout, had been admitted by the golden gate at midnight, and was making for the palace. It was at once closed and fortified, and as such guards as there were took up a position in its lower approaches. Anna had returned from the light on Mount Thabor, to a very rigorous concern about earthly things. Cantacuzena sent to her a proposal that she should share the imperial title with him. Her name would come first in announcements and acclamations, but the real administration should be entrusted to him. She drove out his messengers angrily and abusively, and sent her servants to raise the citizens against him and bring over the Italian troops from Galata. There was still a good deal of loyalty to her, Though her conduct during the last year had alienated many, but the troops routed her supporters, and even began to storm the palace. They were recalled by Cantacuzenus, who then sent the bishops to persuade her to yield. Cantacuzenus behaved with restraint and humanity in his hour of triumph. He was, as we recalled, a refined and cultivated noble though his singular mingling of ambition and moral pretentiousness invests his conduct, and especially his words, with repellent hypocrisy. Anna refused the mediation of the clergy, but in the miserable night which followed, she saw the hopelessness of her position, called a council of her supporters, and decided to make peace. The prisoners were set free, and the gates of the palace thrown open. It is said that John who was now a boy of fifteen, strongly pleaded for peace and weakened the determination of his mother. When Cantacuzenus entered the palace, he found Anna and her son standing under a picture of the virgin which adorned the hall. The empress was sullen and defiant, and probably expected some vindictive action on the part of the victor. But this was never the way of the silken Cantacuzenus. He venerated the sacred picture, kissed the hand of the young emperor, and swore on the virgin that he had not, and had never had, any intention of hurting the imperial family. A general amnesty was granted, and a proposal to wed John and Helena 
was renewed. It was agreed between them that Kentucky Zenus should have sole control of the empire for ten years, and should relinquish it to John on his twenty-fifth birthday. These conditions were singularly moderate, and Kentucky Zenus assures us that some of the troops could hardly be persuaded to subscribe to the new wealth when it was found to include the name of John. Anna and John, moreover, were left in possession of the best palace, that of the Bellarchini, and Kentucky Zenus repaired one of the decaying palaces for himself and Irene, who was summoned from Adrianople, and graciously received at the gate by Anna. Thus, two royal families settled down once more to an unstable peace on the ruins of the once mighty empire. The coronation of Kentucky Zenus and Irene, which followed on the 13th of May, served only to exhibit the poverty and decay of Constantinople. St. Sophia was partly in ruins from the great earthquake of the previous year, and there was no money to repair it. The ceremony had to be performed in the chapel at Blarjni, and in the banquet dishes of pewter and earthenware had to serve instead of the opulent gold and silver plate of earlier times. A week later, the royal children, John was fifteen years old, and Helena, thirteen, were married, and a glittering group of two emperors and three empresses stood proudly on the balcony of the palace to receive the applause of the dwindling population. But it was commonly known that the stones which flashed from crown and mantle were almost all spurious, and that the apparent golden trappings were merely gilded leather. The treasury was empty. The nobility consisted not of the great lords of the land, but salaried officials, and the empire that had once spread under the Roman eagles to the deserts of Arabia, and the waters of Euphrates was now restricted. On the Asiatic side, to so narrow a strip of the neighboring coast that you could almost see the ramparts of Constantinople, the victorious crescent gleaming in the sun. On the west there still remained the greater part of what we know now as Turkey and Greece, but they were exhausted by the unceasing ravages of Turk, Servian, and Bulgarian and tens of thousands of Christian slaves passed yearly into the harems and workshops of the East. In the midst of this devastation, Contagazinus set up a court of cheap and showy and incompetent dignitaries. Irene's two brothers, John and Manuel, received the title Sebastocrator, and were added to the imposing processions and lists of pensionaries. Money was urgently needed, and Contagazinus summoned to his palace all the wealthier citizens and eloquently appealed to them to fill his treasury. They refused to make the least donation. Contagazinus would have us admire the restraint with which he declined to extort the money from them. But we know that, if he shrewdly avoided violence, he did not scruple to obtain money in other irregular ways. A few years afterwards, the Russian church sent a large sum of money for the repairing of St. Sophia, and Gregorius tells us that the emperor appropriated it for the payment of his Turkish mercenaries. Two years later, again, when another army of Turks had to be paid to defend his throne, he seized a great quantity of gold and silver vessels and jewels that remained in the churches and monasteries. We may assume that Anna watched without concern the troubles that now reigned upon the head of the impolitic emperor. In the year after his coronation, his son Michael was persuaded to rebel, and set up a sovereignty over part of Thras. Irene was sent to discuss the matter with him. Gregorius gives us a six-page speech which is supposed to have made to him, and it ended in the father leaving his son in possession, though without the imperial title. Anna's supporters naturally suggested there had been collusion between Contacuzinus and Michael, though that is not at all certain. When Irene returned from her mission, she was pained to learn that the plague had carried off her younger son during her absence. Even greater was her pain, however, the historian says, that her husband favoured the Palamite heresy. Gregorius was one of the chief protagonists of the orthodoxy against the heretics, and it will give some idea of superfluous confusion that was brought upon the affairs of the distracted empire, if I simply observe that some five hundred pages of the remainder of his chronicle are devoted to the controversy. To this heretical taint, Irene tearfully ascribed all the calamities which affected her husband's reign. He had hardly arranged matters in Thras, and was still detained by illness at Didiomoticus, when he learned that the Genoese of Galata 
had burned the fleet which he had laboriously collected money to build, and had attacked the capital. The Genoese for some time farmed the revenues, in plainer terms, pocketed four-fifths of the revenues of Constantinople, and the emperor had endeavoured to lessen their profit. During his absence, they made a raid upon the shipping and the city, and Irene is said to have shown a great energy in directing the defence. For the next year or two, the Bulgarians and Servians ravaged his little empire, and the Turks, whom he hired to meet them, could only be paid out by permission to loot in their turn, and carry off his subjects into slavery. In these circumstances, Cantacuzenus saw a tide of disaffection rising against him, and the young Emperor John began to dream of independence. Writing years afterwards in his quiet monastic home, Cantacuzenus says that Irene and he were wary of the unprofitable conflict, and were both deposed to abdicate and take the black robe, that only the recurrence of trouble in the West and the danger to the empire kept them in the world. This statement is easily refuted by his conduct. He built not a monastery, but a stout citadel or a fortress near the Golden Gate, as if in expectation of the time when John would claim his empire and hired a strong guard of Turkish and Spanish soldiers. Then, when the Servian outbreak in the West, of which he speaks, took place, he insisted that John should accompany him. Anna vehemently protested. The youth was too young to be left in Thessaly, she said, meaning that she distrusted the emperor. Katakizina smoothly replied that it was necessary for her son's protection, that the sultan, wrongly thinking to oblige him, had sent a eunuch to cut the youth's throat. Anna must have felt that the eunuch, if he existed, would have an easier task in Thessaly than in the Balashini palace, but Contagazinus refused to yield, and John set out with him. John was now a good-looking and popular, if a somewhat dissolute and entirely worthless, prince of eighteen, and it would be dangerous to leave him in Constantinople. The Genoese across the water were partisans of the Pelioshi. In the following year, 1351, Cantacuzenus returned to attack the Genoese with the aid of their mortal enemies, the Venetians. As he seems to have intended from the beginning, he left John in Thessalonica with the young Empress Helena, but he was alarmed, surprised in the following year, to hear that the young emperor was corresponding with the Kral of Servia. Gregorius says that, under pressure from the Kral, John engaged to divorce Helena and marry the Kral's sister. When Kentucky Zenus heard this, he went with Anna into the venerable chapel of the Virgin at Blasheny, and swore he would resign the crown to John if he would abandon the crawl and bring Helena to Constantinople. The oath was committed to writing, and Anna herself conveyed it to Thessalonica. It says something, for the singular character of Kentucky Zenus, that they implicitly trusted his oath, and the young couple returned to the capital. After a few weeks, however, John distrusted his colleague and returned to Thras with Helena. Her father seems to have tried to detach her from John, but she protested. Grigora says that she would rather die with John than live with her parents. In return, apparently, for this fidelity, John made a new compact with the Kral and received an army without abandoning his wife. He had once attacked Matthew, the emperor's son, in Adrianople and let civil war loose once more upon the surviving province of the empire, if, indeed, one can call civil war a contest in which hardly a single Greek soldier was enlisted. For the sake of rival Byzantine ambitions, Turk fought Servian and Bulgarian on land, and Venetian fought Genoese at sea, and the decrepit empire sank into its last stage. In return, apparently... The Empress Irene once more endeavoured to make peace with the combatants. She went to Thress and laid before the young emperor a politic and admirable scheme. Admirable, at least, on the supposition that Cantacuzenus is lying when he declares that he and Irene were minded to enter a monastery, which would have been the best solution. On the other hand, John does not command our sympathy and respect. In three years' time, he would be twenty-five and might have laid claim to the throne with perfect right and more success. Irene proposed that John and Matthew should divide the western territory, 
and that Kentucky Zena should hold the remainder until his death. John refused the terms. Irene returned to court, and the Turks and Servians flew at each other. It is only necessary to say that in a comparatively short time, John and Helena were flying on ships to the island of Tanados, and Matthew was declared emperor. The unceasing pendulum of Byzantine court now had thrust the young Empress Helena into obscurity and brought her young rival into prominence and hope of succession. John and Helena were declared to have forfeited the imperial title. Matthew and Irene Paleologina, granddaughter of the elder Andronicus, were crowned in 1354. But we have hardly time to glance at the new empress before the pendulum swims back and Helena returns to the light and the throne. Kentucky Zenus was now detested by all in Constantinople. His heresy, his broken oath, his feud with the Genoese, and the consistent record of disaster during his reign united almost every class against him. Urgent appeals were made to John to come and displace him, and it was not long before a few ships were placed at his disposal, and, during an absence of the emperor, he descended on the capital. But Irene again vigorously defended the cause of her husband, and after sailing the walls, firing a few harmless volleys of abuse at the partisans of the emperor who smiled on the walls, and spending a night with the Italians at Galata, John returned in dejection to his wife and child. Then a quaint type of wealthy adventurer chanced to touch at the port of Tanados and confer with John and he returned to power by one of the most singular of adventures. One stormy night in December 1354, when the emperor slept peacefully in his palace, and the soldiers who lived in the tower which guarded one of the gates by the port were awakened by a heavy crash and loud cries for help. They flung open the gate and descended the stairs, and faintly perceived a few large vessels rolling in the heavy sea. The sailors cried that one of their vessels, which were laden with jars of oil, had been dashed against the walls, and the soldiers went to the water edge to help them to moor the vessels. Scores of armed men then rushed from the holds, killed the guards, and occupied the tower, and before the citizens could grasp what was happening, the enterprising Genoese had lodged John in the tower, and were marching through the streets at the head of two thousand men, crying, Long live the Emperor John! The citizens swarmed to the Hippodrome to the, in the fading morning light, repeating the cry, and Cantacuzenus was awakened to hear that his enemies was in the city with an army. It is worthwhile giving the explanation of this remarkable change in the fortunes of John and Helena. Their vigorous and resourceful ally was a Genoese noble of some wealth, who, with a small fleet, had sailed east in the hope of securing some fragments of the dismembered empire. John offered him the island of Lesbos, and the hand of his sister Maria, if he would help him gain the throne, and he consented. Two large triremes, galleys with two banks of oars, and sixteen uniremes, with one bank of oars, were not the kind of fleet one needed to carry Constantinople by storm. But Francesco Gutelucio was a strategist. He emptied the oil from the vessels on one of his boats, crept up to the wall in the darkness, and bade the soldiers fling the great jars against the wall. This was the noise that awakened the warders of the tower by the key, and the stratagem succeeded as happily as in a romance. I may add that John afterwards carried out his compact, and Gudelucio became Prince of Lesbos and brother-in-law of the Emperor. Cantacuzenus did not venture from his palace. He explains that he could have easily scattered the intruders, which is probably more true than he knew at the time, but he conferred with Irene and he decided that the time had come to enter a monastery. Gregorius says that he was afraid to leave the palace, and, as he was isolated from his citadel by the Golden Gate, and would hardly know the strength of his opponent, one prefers this explanation. He was by no means anxious to enter a monastery. Drawing up his guards at the entrance to the palace, he entered into negotiations with John, and succeeded in getting a promise that the imperial power would be divided. That solution, however did not please the people, and for several days he was assailed with abuse and threats. He yielded to the voice of God, abdicated his dignity, and under the name of Joasaph, 
retired to the monastic world to write his flowing and elegant and mendacious chronicle of his times. Irene was now forced to take the veil, and a robust personality was converted into the black robe figure of the royal nun Eugenia. We do not know when she died, but some years later we find her in her monastery, guiding the education of her granddaughter Theodora. Theodora's parents, Matthew and Irene, continued the civil war for two or three years, but Matthew was then captured and was sent with his ex-empress to spend the remainder of their lives in the island to which they had driven John and Helena. Helena had followed her victorious husband, and, with warm and mutual embraces, joined him at the palace. We do not know how long she lived to enjoy her fortune. I find no further reference to her. Anna was not mentioned further in the Byzantine Chronicles, but a little more may be gleaned about her from Italian writers. Du Cange quotes the Franciscan historian Luke Wadding as saying that she died about the year 1350, and her body was transferred for burial to the shrine of St. Francis of Assisi, for whom she had had a great veneration. I do not find in this in Wadding the reference, at least is wrong, but Wadding does in other pages at the years 1343 and 1349 refer to Anna. In 1343, she sent a Franciscan monk from the convent at Pera to confer with the Pope in regard to the union of Latin and Greek churches. It is clear she remained Latin at heart, and no doubt she had brought with her from the West a veneration for the gentle saint of Assisi. Then the civil war and the triumph of Cantacuzenus put an end for a time to the project of a union. But the correspondence was renewed in 1349. From a reference to her in one of the Pope's letters, we may deduce that she still lived in Constantinople in 1349, and it is the last reference. An Italian writer says she died in that year, but I am unable to find in Wadding's Annals the statement that she was buried at Assisi. End of section 28 Recording by Evere The Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph Maccabee Section 29 of the Empresses of Constantinople This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mike Botez the Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph McCabe Chapter 19, Part 1 The Last Byzantine Empresses A hundred years of life still awaited the Eastern Empire, from the time when John IV returned to the throne, and half a dozen empresses were yet to play their varied parts on the imperial stage. Had any impartial and sagacious observer reflected on the condition of the empire at the time, as we have described it, he would have hardly promised it a new lease of one hundred years' tenancy of its stricken domain. At Constantinople, of course, no one foresaw the end. It is usually in fairly robust, not in really dying, civilizations that we find an apprehension of impending ruin, as in France and England today. But the Byzantine Empire had shrunk to such proportions, the Turks were closing round its capital with such steady advance, and there was so little enlightenment in its mind, or real patriotism in its heart, that it seemed to be very near the end. No miracle was wrought in its favor, but it was saved for a time by one of the accidents of human history. The Tartars, or Mughals, attained the height of their power under the famous Timur, and the ambition of the Turk was destructed and enfeebled. There should be a peculiar interest in studying the features of the empresses who occupy the familiar palaces during this hundred years' grace of the doomed civilization. We are so accustomed to finding the character of a period 
reflected in the character of the empresses, that the last representatives of the imperial line should afford us an instructive insight into the final life phase of a civilization. The idea has become somewhat popular that nations grow old as individuals do, and die of loss of vitality, and that in their last years they pass into singular convulsions or eccentricities. We shall, unfortunately, be impeded in this interesting study by the scantiness of the records. The ample chronicles of Cantacuzenos and his theological rival, close and two or three confused and ill-proportioned writers alone, preserve for us a fragmentary record of the last hundred years. As in all such meager records, the story of the women suffers most. Still, enough is said to give us an adequate idea of the remaining empresses and their times, and it may be said in a word that we find no convulsions or eccentricities or increasing the ability of individuals, but the familiar and unfortunate Byzantine character pursuing its selfish ambitions and passions until the great broom of the Turk sweeps the degenerate successors of the Romans forever out of the East. John the Fourth, now a young man of twenty-five, occupies the throne for nearly forty years, out of the remaining century, but this reign is almost barren of interest for us, and must be treated only as an introduction of his children. Helena had brought with her from Tenedos a young boy named Andronicus, and two brothers, Manuel and Theodore, were added in the course of time to the family. That is all we find recorded of the Empress Helena. She may have died early in her husband's reign, though the fact that he does not marry again until old age suggests, in case of such a man, that she lived to witness his amours and his political ineptitude. The interest passes to her children. Andronicus, a pretty and spoiled boy, was betrothed in his tenth year to Maria, daughter of Alexander of Trebizond, who was about the same age when she became the empress-elect. However, the character of Andronicus was to defraud her of the promise of the crown. We do not know in what year they were married, but it must have been before 1369, when John went to Italy, leaving Constantinople in charge of Andronicus. The Turks were again advancing, and John could see no escape except with the assistance of the Latins. He first visited Venice and received a most flattering welcome, but no material help. Borrowing a sum of money from Venetian bankers, he went on to Rome and opened negotiations with the Vatican. It seemed to the Vatican an excellent opportunity to convince the Greeks that the Holy Ghost did proceed from both the Father and the Son the chief dogmatical point at issue between the two churches, and John hurriedly embraced that dogma, and would have embraced any number of dogmas, in the hope of being rewarded with an army. The reward was very meager, however, and after trying a few more princes with no more success, he returned to Venice to re-embark for the East. Then the Venetian moneylenders detained his imperial person as a common debtor, and he appealed to Andronicus to seize sufficient church treasure to pay his debt. Andronicus was enjoying his short spell of power over the shrunken treasury during his father's absence, and the demand was irksome. He sent word to Venice that the clergy declined to allow him to seize their chalices and reliquaries, and that, to his regret, he saw no way of delivering his father from the debtor's prison. He was a true paleologus, 
a selfish voluptuary, eager only to have the sole right to the keys of the treasury. His younger brother, Manuel, however, professed indignation, zealously gathered funds to meet the debt, and hastened to Venice to release his father. He may have been prompted by a sincere piety, but the natural effect of his action was that, when John returned dolefully to the city, Manuel began to wear purple boots, and the chances of Andronicus and Maria occupying the throne became slender. It appeared that the less the empire became, the fiercer was the struggle for it. The Turks had already reached and taken Adrianople, and Thessalonica was now the only large town in the possession of the empire besides the capital. A few years later, Thessalonica went. Manuel, who governed it, and was a youth of spirit and ambition, made a futile effort to break loose of the Turks. He was pardoned by the Sultan Murad, but he lost Thessalonica. After the return of John, the pressure of the Turks had been evaded by voluntary subjection, and the Emperor of Constantinople was now a vassal of the Sultan, holding under his sovereign lord, the Turk, the city itself and a few thousand square miles of poverty-stricken territory to the west of the capital. He was compelled to do homage and to supply a hundred soldiers, captained by one of his sons, whenever the Sultan pleased. There was, however, still a fair revenue from such sources, as trade and port duties, and John contrived to excite the envy of his elder son by the luxurious dinners, the choice wines and the pretty dancing girls, which he could still afford to enjoy. It is enough to say that John the Fourth, in his desolate little empire, contracted a very severe gout, and Andronicus was not unwilling to run the same risk. When, therefore, John was summoned to join the Sultan's army in Asia, and Andronicus was once more left in charge, the foolish and egoistical youth made another effort to secure his father's income. Sultan Murad had left his son Saoji in charge of his European possessions, and the two princes became close friends. In 1376, the news reached the Sultan that they had disowned their fathers and proclaimed themselves independent sovereigns. The unhappy John was at once suspected of collusion, though the Sultan came in time to realize that John was not at all willing to leave the palace to his son until he was compelled to do so. The conspiracy was soon settled. As the Sultan's troops approached, the two youths threw themselves in Didymoticus, but they were compelled to surrender. Murad put out the eyes of Saoji and sent Andronicus to his father with orders to inflict the same punishment on him under pain of war. John directed that his sight should be destroyed by boiling vinegar, and Andronicus was confined in a tower near the Blackerne Palace. His son, a boy of tender years, was punished in the same way, and Maria sadly joined them in the dreary tower. For two years Andronicus and Maria lamented their evil fortune in the Tower of Anemas. In the course of time it had appeared that the blinding was not complete. Andronicus recovered the use of one eye, and his son was merely afflicted with a squint. The Sultan Murad, moreover, died, and Constantinople was not at all extravagantly devoted to the ruling monarch. Andronicus, therefore, found a means of communicating with the Genoese at Galata, and, with their aid, the family were stealthily delivered from the tower and taken across the water. During his brief rebellion, Andronicus had promised the island of Tenedos to the Genoese, in return for their help, 
and they had, of course, no hope of getting it from John. From Galata, Andronicus made his way to the camp of the new sultan, and promised him several hundred pounds of gold a year, if he would lend him an army with which to attack his father. The Turk had, as we may see presently, a large and expensive establishment to maintain, and he accepted the bargain. Of moral or decent feelings, there seemed to be a complete absence at the time, in all parties. The troops were put under the command of the one-eyed fugitive, and he drew cautiously near the city. He had the good fortune to find John and Manuel, quite unsuspicious of his approach, in a suburban palace, and the two, together with a younger brother, Theodore, were promptly lodged in the tower of Animas, from which Andronicus had escaped. The more thoroughgoing sultan urged Andronicus to put them to death, but such conduct did not become a Christian monarch. They were entrusted to the care of a corps of Bulgarian guards, and Andronicus and Maria mounted the gilded thrones. But their tenure did not last more than two or three years, and we may close the series of petty revolutions in a few words. John and Manuel communicated with the Venetians and offered them the island of Tenedos, one of the few fragments of empire that a Byzantine ruler might still sell for a tawdry crown, if they would displace Andronicus. The plot was detected in time and the Venetians were repulsed, though they consoled themselves with taking Tenedos. In the third year of imprisonment, however, the Bulgarian guards were duped by a half-witted servant named Angel, or Devil Angel, and John and his sons escaped to Scutari, and opened in their turn a deal with the Sultan. They offered him twice the sum offered by Andronicus. He genially sent an officer to learn which monarch the people really did prefer and would defend, and was informed that Manuel was the favorite. Lest one should be disposed to think, Manuel much better than the rest of the family, I may emphasize that Manuel had offered a vast sum of money, out of the poor revenue of the city, and had promised to lead out two thousand troops every spring, in the service of the Turk, if the crown were conferred on him. It was a sordid squabble for the last coppers of the beggared city, and it ended in a compromise. John was to occupy the throne, Andronicus and his sons to be his heirs. A more or less royal residence was found for Andronicus and Maria at Selimbria, and on the revenues of that and a few other towns they contrived to maintain a tolerable state. As soon as Andronicus had gone, John crowned Manuel, in defiance of the treaty, and sought a fitting wife for him, and his search had the effect of bringing one more pathetic young empress upon the scene. John was now in his sixth decade of life, a prematurely aged and very gouty man, hardly able to stand erect, but his sensuous nature was not extinct. He sent to Trebizond to ask Manuel for the daughter of the Emperor Alexis, and Eudosia Komnena, the young widow of a Turkish noble, proved to be so beautiful that the veteran libertine decided to marry her himself. He was not an old man. Ducange puts the marriage, with some reason, about the year 1380, when John would be 51 years old but he is described by the indignant chronicler as worn with debauch and tottering with gout, and we must think lightly of the lady who could accept his hand in order to share his crown, the crown of imitation diamonds. We have, however, no direct knowledge of Eudosia. She shared John's imperial poverty for ten years and disappeared at his death. 
we are disposed to suspect her influence when we find John, in his old age, beginning to restore the fortifications of the city in order to prepare for the last conflict to the Turk. Sultan Bayezid suddenly called on Manuel to appear at his court and then ordered John to destroy the two marble towers he had built beside the Golden Gate, or he would put out the eyes of Manuel. The old emperor obeyed, and wearily lay down to die. 1391 Andronicus had died before his father, and by the treaty of 1381, the crown should pass to his son John. But Manuel had been crowned in 1384, and he determined to seize the purple. He was still in the court of Bayezid when the news of his father's death came. The Turkish monarchs now had their capital at Brusa, originally Prusa, a town about sixty miles from Constantinople, across the Sea of Marmara, which had been famed for some centuries as a pleasure and health resort, on account of its warm springs. Here the latter sultans had gathered all the luxury, which would in an earlier age have passed to Constantinople. No imitation stones flashed from the turban or the scimitar of the sultan and his nobles, for he had great stores of emeralds, rubies, and diamonds. A large park sheltered curious beasts and birds from all parts of the known world and the quiet gardens and gorgeous halls were enlivened by the forced song of the most beautiful boys and women that Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, Hungary, and even more distant Christian countries could supply. On this Sybaritic paradise the dreaded Timor was to fall in a few years, but in 1391 the Tartars still lingered in the wilds, and the Turk dreamed of world dominion. Manuel was a mean vassal among a crowd, the captain of a hundred feudal soldiers in this glittering court, and he decided to fly to Constantinople and shut himself behind its still formidable walls. They proved worthy of his trust, and for several years, though to the great suffering of the inhabitants, Manuel defied the sultan. During the siege, apparently Manuel married, so that an empress shared the straits of the long and terrible siege. She was Irene, or Helene, the daughter of Constantine Dragassus, who governed the part of Macedonia. Irene is rarely mentioned in the scrappy and contradictory chronicles of the time but she is one of the few of whom we have a pictorial representation. The miniature, found in a manuscript of the works of Dennis, the so-called Areopagite, is a very quaint, though not very instructive, picture of Irene and Manuel, and their two sons, but he would be a bold physiognomist, who would venture to make a text of the flat and conventional features of a Byzantine portrait. Her experience of Byzantine life was dreary. During nearly seven or eight years, including the brief respite, the Turks swarmed round the walls of Constantinople and were only prevented by their lack of powerful rams and slings, to say nothing of that new implement called a cannon which was just entering European warfare from penetrating. The great areas of desolation within the walls became more desolate, and the scanty supplies of food sold at appalling prices. With the sultan outside could be seen John, the son of Andronicus, whom Bayezid affected to consider the lawful emperor, and although Manuel was a brave and humane ruler, the weary citizens were ready to acclaim John, but Manuel received the aid of Marshal de Bossicold and two thousand men, as well as a fleet of Venetians and Genoese, and held out stoutly until, at the close of 1399, the appearance of Timur the Tartar in the rear of the Sultan persuaded him to make peace. 
John was admitted as co-emperor, and an effort was made to restore the stricken city. Manuel was the finest of the later paleology, and although we cannot admire of the steps he took to attain power, he made an excellent effort to use it for the restoration of the empire. It seemed to him that his hope lay in enlisting the interest of the West against the infidel, and he set out at once with Irene and her two children. He left Irene in Greece, however, with his brother Theodore and Bartholomea, and thus no Byzantine empress was ever seen farther west than Greece. Manuel took ship to Italy, where very little was to be obtained, went to Paris, where he found Charles the Sixth insane, and even crossed the sea to the little island, which had once sent so many Varangians to Constantinople. This visit to England induces one of the later Byzantine chroniclers, Chalco Condylas, to tell his readers something of that country, and we are interested to learn that in the days of Henry the Fourth, Englishmen shared their wives in common when they traveled, and held it their first duty to offer their wives to visitors. But he adds that London is already the greatest city of the West, though the strange island produces no wine, and its inhabitants speak a most peculiar language. Manuel obtained little money and a few volunteers, and was returning in dejection when he heard that Timur had routed the Turks. Only a few years before, Bayezid had received legates from Timur in his palace at Brusa. He had disdainfully shaved them and sent them back to their barbaric master. Then the Tartars had swept over Asia Minor, scattered all the pretty boys and ladies of the Brusa Pleasance, and compelled John of Constantinople to transfer his alliance from Bayezid to himself. Manuel confirmed the vassalage on his return, but he sent John into exile and set about restoring his empire, while the giants were down each other's strength. But I pass over the next decade, during which the internal troubles of the Turks gave Manuel an opportunity to reform and reconstruct. Our historian, Finley, speaks somewhat contemptuously of his work, and able and well-intentioned as Manuel was, it may be admitted that the work was too vast for him. In any case, we lose sight of Irene for several decades, after the return of Manuel in 1405, and will pass at once to the next, and, as far as we know, last empress of Constantinople. End of section 29. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 30 of the Empresses of Constantinople. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nancy Midland, Oakland, California. The Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph McCabe. Chapter 19, Part 2. The Last Byzantine Empresses. The introduction of Maria of Trebizond is preceded by some romantic adventures in the private life of the court, of which the chroniclers give us a fairly ample account. Irene had six sons, of whom the eldest, John, married the daughter of the Grand Duke of Moscow in the year 1414. He was already twenty-four years old and of irregular life, but the hands of the princesses and princes of Byzantium were no longer sought in the courts of the world. Anna was a child of eleven years, and we may assume that John remained with his mistresses until, three years later, Anna was carried off by the plague. Again, there seems to have been some difficulty in finding a wife for the heir to the throne, but in or about the year 1420, legates were sent to Italy, and they returned with two eligible young ladies. 
Cleope, the beautiful and gifted daughter of Count Malatesta of Rimini, was married to Irene's second son, Theodore, and went to spend an unhappy life with that restless prince in Lacedaemonia. For John, the legates had brought Sophia, daughter of the Marquis of Montferrat, and she and her husband at once received the imperial title. The appearance of Sophia of Montferrat on the imperial stage was brief and eventful. She was a tall and very graceful young woman, with golden hair that fell to her feet, a beautiful neck and broad round shoulders, fine arms and hands and fingers like crystal, says the chronicler. But nature had spoiled these many perfections by misshaping her nose and giving a very careless finish to her eyes and eyebrows. John disliked her, keeping himself coldly aloof from her and pressed his father to send her back to Montferrat. A more chatty chronicler, however, gives a more serious reason for John's dislike. Sophia had been as virtuous as she was beautiful until she came to Constantinople, but whether it was the taint in the atmosphere of the court, most of the paleology have natural children, or the example of her husband, she quickly lapsed. There was a natural son of her husband about the court, and this youth she incited into a most unnatural relation. A maid of the court caught them in flagrant delicto and told her lover, and the lover informed John. By making a hole in the wall of the bedroom, John convinced himself of the truth of the story and was very indignant. It may be stated on behalf of Sophia that when John spoke of the indignity to one of the court jesters— he was reminded that he had himself some time before stolen his son's mistress. It is therefore not impossible that the seduction was on the side of the youth and had a vindictive character. Such was the kind of life witnessed in the last ruins of the Eastern Empire. John insisted that Sophia must go home. Manuel, possibly conscious of the difficulty of finding alliances, was reluctant to send her. Sophia found her position intolerable, however, and decided to run away with the aid of the Genoese of Galata. They moored a galley at the foot of the imperial gardens, and Sophia, pretending to go for a stroll in the garden with her Italian maids and young courtiers, walked to the quay and was shipped over the water to Pera before her flight became known. It was published in the city the next day and there was much buckling of arms and preparing of boats to avenge this last outrage of the hated Genoese. Manuel was, however, now overshadowed by his son, and Sophia was permitted to depart quietly for her home. The chronicler adds that she was received with great honor and rejoicing at Montferrat, and ended her days in a nunnery. The date of Sophia's flight and of John's third marriage is difficult to determine. The plainest reading of the contradictory chronicles is that the trouble occurred in the last year of Manuel's reign, and the flight took place a month after his death, but this is inconsistent with the express declaration that the old emperor intervened in the dispute. Manuel died on the 25th of July, 1425. For some years, the ambition of the Turk, who had quickly recovered from the heavy blows dealt by Timur, had fully revived and had given him great anxiety. A young sultan, Murad II, had succeeded to the throne, and Manuel had imprudently recognized a pretender to the succession. When the young sultan vigorously took the field, hanged the pretender, and drew up under the walls of Constantinople, Manuel, now a feeble old man of seventy-five, left the direction of affairs to John, and retired to pursue that ardent study of the scriptures which absorbed him in his later years. John abjectly apologized, but the angry sultan ranged his machines against the walls and proceeded to batter them. He was drawn off for a time by the strategy of John, who had the sultan's brother conveyed to Brusa and set up as sultan. But Murad returned more angry than ever, and one of the last earthly sounds to catch the ear of the aged Manuel was the roar of the first cannons that seemed to have appeared at Constantinople. The diffusion of knowledge at the time may be gathered from the fact 
that one of the most learned of the chroniclers in discussing these bombards observes that he does not think they are of very ancient origin. Before the end of the siege, Manuel was warned of an attack of apoplexy that his death was near. He donned the black robes, became plain brother Matthew, and died two days, not two years, as Finley says, afterwards at the age of seventy-seven. Irene also then retired from the world and became the nun Hypomene, whom we shall later find endeavoring to settle the quarrels of her selfish children. She remained mistress despoini of the empire and watched its slow decay with concern. John was able, after the death of his father, to obtain peace from the Sultan at the price of a heavy annual subsidy, and the empire entered upon its last quarter of a century of melancholy decay. Long years of effort had taught the Sultans that their siege engines were not powerful enough to crack the heavy shell in which earlier emperors had enclosed the city, and they were content to hold it in vassalage and draw a large tribute from its sinking revenue. The time had gone by for the last serious effort to save the empire. Its trade had passed to the Italians, and of the provinces from which it had so long extorted its rich supply of gold, there now remained only a few towns to the west of Constantinople, a part of the Peloponnesus and Thessalonica, which would soon be sold to Venice for fifty thousand gold coins. The metropolis, therefore, continued to shrink within its eighteen-mile enclosure, and as a severe pestilence fell on the inhabitants for the last time in 1431, they were reduced to something like one hundred thousand instead of the million they had once been. It was over this dismal little empire that the last empress, Maria of Trebizond, was called to preside. Whether the flight of Sophia came before or after the death of Manuel, John V. Who succeeded his father soon found it necessary to seek a bride. He married in 1427 the daughter of Alexis of Trebizond, a handsome woman of excellent character, and we are fortunate enough to have a short description from the pen of a French knight of Maria and her desolate surroundings. Bertrandon de la Brocchiere made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and returned through Constantinople in the year 1432. The plague had ravaged it in the previous year, and Bertrandon sympathetically refers to the broad spaces of ruin that half filled the enclosure within the walls. He notes that the Greeks are still busy with their processions, religious and imperial, and that they still cherish in their churches such important relics as the pillar at which Christ was scourged, the board on which his body was laid out. The gridiron on which Saint Lawrence had been martyred, and the stone on which Abraham had offered food to his angel visitors. Apparently, the credentials of these relics had not been imposing enough to convince Western purchasers, indulgent as they were. When the knight heard that the empress was about to proceed to Saint Sophia and on to the Blackernay Palace, he went to the square to see the procession. We know what the spectacle would have been at an earlier date. First would come a corps of excubitors or varangians with shining axes and gold accoutrements, clearing a way for the crowd. Then a regiment of pale-faced eunuchs, their leaders dressed in white silk and glittering with jewels, would precede a large body of maids and dames, from foreign slaves to the greatest ladies of the empire. More superbly dressed than most of the queens of Europe, and lastly would come the gold-plated, gem-encrusted litter drawn by four white horses, possibly with one of the highest nobles in Europe at the reign of each, the empress sitting stiffly in her gold-cloth tunic, over which spread the mantle of purple silk with deep embroidered edges, and, if it were a solemn occasion. A massive domed crown on her head, from which large diamonds and pearls fell in long chains to her shoulders. Very different was the spectacle witnessed by Bertrandon de la Brocchiere. Maria's suite consisted of two ladies, three eunuchs, and three aged ministers. With this poor escort, she was to drive the several miles of road to the Blackernay Palace. 
She wore a high hat, probably a silk-covered mitre, with three golden plumes, and she had broad, flat rings set with a few jewels in her ears. She was young and fair. I should not, says the pilgrim, have had a fault to find with her had she not been painted, and assuredly she had not any need of it. The paint seems to have been the one surviving portion of the luxurious inheritance of the empresses of Constantinople. Maria was a woman of tame and mediocre, if faultless, character, and as her husband was weak and incompetent, the miserable empire lay helplessly awaiting the end. Patriotism was an extinct virtue. The absence of truth, honor, and patriotism, says Finley, among the Greek aristocracy during the last century of the Eastern Empire, is almost without a parallel in history. The Western Empire had, even in its last years, had its Symmachus, its Praetextatus, and its Flavianus. Irene's sons could do no more than quarrel for their selfish interests in the ruins. Andronicus, who had charge of Thessalonica, which was restored to the Greeks for a time, sold it to Venice and went to enjoy his fortune in the Peloponnesus. In that last fragment of the empire, Theodore and Constantine were on the verge of civil war owing to the clash of their petty ambitions. There seemed to be no resource in the East, and John, leaving the city in charge of his wife and mother, went to make a last appeal to his fellow Christians of the West to stem the Mohammedan tide. It was now clear that the Greek church would, as the price of assistance, have to surrender its independence to the papacy, and John took with him the patriarch and his bishops. It may be read in history how, at the councils of Ferrara, 1438, and Florence, 1439, the Greek bishops abandoned the positions they had fiercely maintained for so many centuries against the Western Church and, with one exception, signed the Roman claims. I will add from the Byzantine writers only that whatever arguments were discussed in open council and however pressing the need of the empire, it was a secret and generous payment of gold to the Byzantine bishops which finally convinced them. They bargained like Syrian peddlers for their signature. It may also be read in history how John returned in deep dejection to his mother. Instead of the promised fleet, the Pope had given him only two galleys and three hundred men and a very moderate sum of money. His wife, Maria, had died during his absence. The Sultan was pressing for an explanation of this visit to Italy, and the people and lower clergy of Constantinople were infuriated at the surrender of their spiritual independence and were now treacherously joined by the corrupt bishops who had signed the decrees. John wearily sustained the attack, assuring the sultan that he had visited Italy only in order to discuss certain details of the Christian faith and secretly pressing the pope and the western monarchs to fulfill their promises. Hippomene, now an aged and venerable lady, sadly watched the struggle of her sons and endeavored to curb their selfish tempers. Demetrius, her youngest son, recollected that he, unlike John, had been born in the Porphyra and disputed the shaking throne of his brother. He gathered about him a ragged army of Turks and looted whatever was left of the suburbs beyond the walls until his force melted away on account of the poverty of the plunder, and he consented to be reconciled. Theodore, the second son, complained that he had not enough income to maintain his state in the town of Celembria, which he governed, and he demanded a share of John's. It was refused, and he in turn was about to lead troops against the capital when John, in his fifty-eighth year, was removed by a greater power, on the 31st of October, 1448, from the scene of his troubles. No one even now suspected that the next emperor would be the last, that in five years the crescent would glitter over the imperial palaces, and the struggle for the throne broke out afresh. Demetrius alone was in the city when John died, and he noisily renewed his claim to the purple, but his character was too well known for him to find serious adherence. 
His mother united with the citizens in preventing him from succeeding, and they sent legates to ask the Sultan to allow Constantine, the ablest of the brothers, to be crowned. He had lately been opposed to the Sultan, but permission was granted, and to his despotate at Sparta the legates were sent with the imperial ensigns. Constantinople did not even enjoy a last coronation, as the new emperor was crowned at Sparta on the 6th of January, 1449, and would not have the ceremony repeated. He favored the union of the churches. He reached Constantinople in March, and the royal brothers gathered in the presence of Hippomene and such nobles as Constantinople could still boast to swear resonant oaths of peace and loyalty. Constantine had been twice married and widowed when, in his early forties, he ascended the throne. His first wife, Theodora, daughter of the Count of Tocco, had died in 1429. His second wife, Catherine, daughter of Notarius Peleologus, had died in 1443, two years after her marriage. There were no children of either marriage, and Constantine made it one of his first duties to provide a third wife and an heir to the throne. The historian Francis was entrusted with this delicate mission, and he set out from Constantinople with an escort which, it was thought, would impress the king of Iberia and the emperor of Trebizond, to whom he was sent. It was, as he describes it, a weird mixture of monks, musicians, and medical men. Their baggage consisted mainly of musical instruments instead of the superb robes and plate that an earlier escort might have taken— and Francis says that they did impress and astonish the foreign courts. But they were unfortunately wrecked on the way to Iberia, a country between the Black Sea and the Caspian, and seem to have been detained for nearly two years by lack of funds. And they then discovered that the king of Iberia expected a gift for his daughter instead of presenting one with her, and returned unsuccessful to Constantinople. In the meantime, apparently on the 23rd of March, 1450, Hippomene had brought to a close her long and troubled life. With her death, the series of empresses of Constantinople comes to an end, but their story cannot be intelligibly concluded without a glance at the great catastrophe which, three years later, swept away the tottering thrones and made an end of Christian Byzantium. The Sultan, Murad II, who had so long looked with indulgent eye on the remnant of the Byzantine Empire, died in 1451. His son and successor, Mohammed II, was a young man of 21 years, a very able, highly cultivated, and extremely ambitious young prince. To him, the existence of this Christian island, the city of Constantinople, in the ocean of Mohammedan conquest, was an intolerable anomaly. The Turks had long since carried the crescent over what we now call Turkey in Europe, and it was only by sea that Constantinople could communicate directly with the other Christian powers. To put an end to this Christian avenue into the heart of his dominion and make the great city the capital of the Mohammedan world was the early ambition of Mohammed II. Probably every sultan for a hundred years or more had desired this, but their siege machinery had hitherto proved incapable of shattering the stout old walls of that city. Constantine the Eleventh underrated the young sultan and very soon gave him a pretext for an attack. Mohammed had signed a truce with the Hungarians and gone to settle certain disturbances in his Asiatic dominions when he received a most insolent and offensive message from Constantinople. He must at once increase the pension of Prince Orkan, the nephew of Suleiman, then living in retirement at Constantinople, or else the Greeks will consider Orkan's claim to the Turkish throne. It was the last blunder of the paleology. Mohammed courteously heard and dismissed the legates and proceeded to pacify his Asiatic province. Constantine had grossly failed to appreciate the young sultan's character. After his coronation at Adrianople, his Christian vassals, the emperors of Trebizond and Constantinople, the Duke of Athens, etc., had hastened to do homage, and had seen only an accomplished, amiable, and, in private life, vicious young man from whom they had little to fear. 
Shortly afterwards, the court at Constantinople was alarmed to hear that a large army of Turkish workmen had arrived at a spot on the Asiatic coast only five miles from the city and were, with great rapidity, building a powerful fort which would command the entrance to the Black Sea. Constantine sent a protest. Mohammed disdainfully replied that he would do as he liked in his own dominions. In time, the Turkish soldiers of the district fell to quarrels with Constantine's subjects, and the emperor, ordering the gates of the city to be closed, demanded some recompense. Mohammed at once declared war and went to Adrianople to concentrate his forces and gather a more powerful armament than his predecessors had used. The value of powder was now realized, and although they were crude objects of only moderate effectiveness, immense canyons, which could throw stone balls weighing more than a hundred pounds, were associated with the old rams and slings and towers. Constantine quickly realized the gravity of his position and made every effort to patch the fortifications, enlist troops, and provision the town. An urgent appeal was sent to Italy, and hundreds of volunteers and adventurers were attracted, though the Pope was still mainly concerned about the recognition of his supremacy, and sent a cardinal who distracted the doomed city with fierce religious controversy. When the hour came, Constantine found that barely 6,000 Greeks could be induced to enlist in the last defense of their city, and these with other two or three thousand Italians, had to hold fifteen miles of wall with many gates against seventy thousand Turks and three hundred vessels. On the 12th of December, 1452, the Church of St. Sophia rang with its last great Christian celebration, the solemn union of the Latin and Greek churches, the price of that secular aid which was destined never to arrive. Four months later, the vanguard of the Turks was decried from the walls, and day by day the endless regiments and engines of attack and the monstrous cannons came from the line of the horizon and took up their stations. For a time, the spirits of the besieged were maintained by those little successes which so often precede a great catastrophe. Four large Italian ships had fought their way through the Turkish fleet and brought provisions. Mohammed's biggest gun had burst. A general attack of the enemy had been repulsed. But the incessant rain of projectiles made at last a ghastly breach in the stout wall, and on the 29th of May, before dawn, the dreaded Janissaries flung themselves at the defenders. The last of the paleology died like a man. Later in the day, the victorious Turks swept over his body and the bodies of some thousands of his people, and the last remnant of the Byzantine Empire was swallowed up in the Mohammedan tide. And the relics of its culture passed westward, and, meeting and blending with the humanism of the later Middle Ages, begot the new man and new woman of the Renaissance, the heralds of modern times. This is the end of Section 30. Recording by Nancy Midland, Oakland, California. The Empresses of Constantinople by Joseph McCade.